Hello, it's Mrs. Wallace, uh, Hannah and Pravit. I just wanted to give you this uh, video because I know that you have uh, missed a few classes and um, I just wanted to catch up with you. Um, Hannah, I think you were in class on Monday, but not on Tuesday and on uh, Thursday. And Pravit, you missed uh, most of the classes last week because we meet on Tuesday and Wednesday and Friday. So um, Hannah, you might want to like fast forward because I think some of what is on the screen you might have already uh, seen, but I wasn't exactly sure. So, you know, just feel free to uh, continue ahead if any of the video is like a repeat of something we did in class. And I will try to just highlight some of the big takeaways. Uh, but this way, at least you have the slideshow and you have a place where you can ask questions. And then for class uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, you know, you won't be um, as <laughs> as confused. Uh, a couple of things we talked about, um, just some context uh, during the Civil War that sets up uh, Reconstruction. One, of course, is that as early as 1863, Abraham Lincoln was talking about uh, emancipation. This is emancipation of enslaved persons, really only in places that had been in rebellion. So if you look at the map on the bottom right, you can see uh, the um, southern states in the red that were part of the Confederacy. Uh, this little blue part here is New Orleans. That is a section that is under union control. So enslaved persons there or enslaved persons in the border states um, were not able to be uh, em emancipated. And that's just the nature of the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln didn't think he had constitutional power to uh, enable all enslaved persons to be free. But because um, there had been rebellion and because the Union Army was already in the process of seeing some enslaved persons as contraband and seizing um, a great deal of Southern resources, enslaved persons became part of that. So Lincoln comes to write the Emancipation Proclamation because he felt that there was some constitutional standing for the federal government to be able to emancipate slaves um, in states that were in rebellion. And part of the idea was that states that decided uh, to come back into the Union and were going to agree to, um, you know, emancipate their slaves, you know, states could come back, in other words, into the Union. If they didn't by January 1st, 1863, then uh, the federal government was basically sending uh, the Union Army uh, to forcibly emancipate slaves. We also have a lot of enslaved persons that are in states like Texas that are way behind Confederate lines. And some of those um, enslaved persons aren't going to be emancipated until after the war is over. So the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, on one hand, doesn't really have, you know, this effect where all persons are freed. It's not really that case at all. There's limited numbers of people uh, who are freed a little bit at a time through the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, but it does change the nature of the war. And so it's an announcement, in other words, by the president that, um, you know, slavery is something that's going to end. And so it uh, has a huge significance in terms of the war. This is just a um, uh, an addition to the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, the Union starts to advertise for um, Black men to come into the military. And by the end of the uh, Civil War, you have um, about 10% of the Union Army that served um, ends up being uh, African Americans, right? So it's actually really significant at the end of the Civil War in 1865. Um, it's about 200,000 people altogether. Uh, this is all volunteer. Uh, only white soldiers were drafted. So there's a draft pretty early on. It's a controversial draft, but um, black soldiers um, will serve in segregated units um, led by white officers, and they have very significant um, experiences, in a lot of cases getting assigned some of the more difficult uh, battles. And up until a certain point, uh, they are actually paid uh, less than uh, white soldiers. And that's something that's rectified in 1864, mostly because of Frederick Douglass. Uh, this is just an image of a black regiment, oftentimes coming from the same area. So you might have like the, you know, um, you know, regiment from Brooklyn or the regiment from a certain area of Massachusetts or whatever. Uh, so, you know, as um, certain regiments uh, became very affected in, in battle, sometimes, you know, communities lost uh, all of the uh, people in a regiment. 
Um, but it, the other uh, piece of context that's just kind of important as a political piece of context, in 1864, uh, President Lincoln will rerun for president. And so this is odd because he's running in the middle of a war. The South is seceded and there's a great deal of, you know, kind of controversy. Um, the election is largely going to exist only in the Union. The Confederacy has their own president. Jefferson Davis is a president. So this election is largely for states that are in the Union. But at this point in time, in 1864, the war is going on now for four years. And there's a lot of people who are discontented with the war. They don't like the fact that the war is not over. Uh, you get a lot of people in different political parties who want to see an end to the war sooner rather than later. And there are just some you know, uh, additional criticisms that Lincoln gets. He will run against uh, George McClellan, who was once a general in the Union Army that Lincoln actually fired. So there's some like bad blood between these two guys to begin with. Uh, the spectrum of political uh, views, just like in Congress today, we know there's like a spectrum of uh, political views. We tend to have a few uh, different groupings. So um, on the Democrat side, the most radical group, and this is where McClellan would sit, would be a peace Democrat. Um, and these are peace Democrats in the North. You know, Democrats tended to be the party of uh, the South and party of slavery. But we also have some Democrats in the North. And these are some cases like some uh, people who are businessmen who wanted uh, to go back to um, engaging with the South, kind of a pre-war state of affairs um, with an immediate arm armistice and an end to the war, um, just kind of returning you know, the country back together for the purpose of doing business and the purpose of um, connecting the North and the South. And this kind of you know, completely ignores the uh, interest in the rights of free people or the interest in uh, slavery as an issue. It's kind of a uh, movement that that's not as significant. You have in the middle uh, moderate Republicans, which is really where Lincoln sits. He's a moderate Republican. He wants to win the war. He wants to preserve the Union. And there's acceptance now that in addition to not having slavery in the West, slavery in the South can be abolished. So this is like a big change up in the middle of the war for moderate Republicans. War Democrats are kind of on that same page. There's also Democrats who see that the union is key. The union needs to you know, win the war and slavery is gonna be abolished. That's something that's going to be expected. But this is a group of people who largely don't see that the future uh, rights for freed people are gonna include like the vote. And that's in Northern states, even though Northern states had gotten rid of um, the um, uh, of slavery, right? By 1860s, um, states have either gradually emancipated slaves or have banned enslavement. So you end up with um, the Northern states not having slavery, but not all the Northern states offer uh, the right to vote or other uh, types of civil liberties for African-Americans. So, um, you know, that is something that we don't see. Radical Republicans, you know, are the group of people in Congress uh, who is going to be for abolishing slavery. That's like the first step. And then political equality for black Americans. So the additional piece of reconstruction for radical Republicans will be, you know, the 15th Amendment, the right to vote, citizenship, uh, mandating citizenship. Um, you know, things like that. So um, the difference in these groups is very significant and reconstruction is kind of happening in the context of these different um, factions, okay? So we have radical Republicans, this middle group, like kind of where Lincoln is, and then this other uh, Peace Democrats group. Uh, you can see in 1864, Lincoln does carry the election. Uh, he actually wins uh, significantly. Um, you can see the Confederate states. So if you kind of get an idea of some of the Confederate states, you know, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, and so on. You can see uh, some of the northern states in the blue, right? So the states uh, that are uh, fighting, you know, and you also see um, the uh, blue and the red. Um, the blue states um, and the red states are actually the northern states, uh, but the red states voted for McClellan. You can see New Jersey in that category. New Jersey does not vote for Lincoln will also not vote for some of the Reconstruction Amendments, like the right to vote, vote for Black Americans. Uh, New Jersey actually has a pretty Southern section, and it was pretty dominant. Okay, You could see Delaware, too, uh, which uh, maintained slavery uh, a good amount of uh, the time. So a little bit about Reconstruction, and we'll kind of just note uh, the key pieces. Uh, Reconstruction starts in 1863, you know, under President Lincoln. When you think of Reconstruction, think of it as like kind of two things. One is about um, bringing the country back together. So trying to enable the South to 
come back into the country and be a part of like the larger uh, United States. This means bringing Southern delegates back into Congress. This means kind of engaging again in, uh, you know, all of the, um, you know, kind of uh, things that were conflicts. And this is also going to mean an end to slavery and to some degree, a conversation about rights for free people. So um, uh, Professor Blight from uh, Yale University often describes this as a question of like healing and justice. There are all these issues of like how to bring the country together after years of war. And then there's this other question of like, what kind of rights, you know, will people have in this new society, especially uh, in the South where 4 million people who were um, enslaved now are going to be, you know, uh, free people. What kind of rights will those people have and who will protect those people, states, you know, federal government. So there's like a lot of questions. Lincoln comes up with a plan that's like, often described as pretty loose. And this is like during the war, it's called Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction, basically says, you know, uh, listen, we can have, um, you know, some of the Southern states, I, you know, say that they're loyal. And he basically says, if 10% of, the, of a Southern state says that they're loyal, uh, we can, you know, have that state come back into the union. He will, um, you know, do this without really consulting Congress. So we call this the first presidential reconstruction. It's 100% under the president. And for the most part, this is going to lead to a lot of pardons, uh, except for the highest ranking military and civilian Confederate officers. So some people would be excluded from, you know, operating uh, in a new government, but uh, many people would be pardoned. And so it's pretty forgiving. Um, you know, and if 10% of the voting population in an 1860 election had taken an oath of loyalty, it would be recognized. And that's 10% of the current voting population. So largely that's going to mean uh, not freed people. The other thing about this is we do get some government. So Louisiana, Tennessee, Arkansas do come in. Uh, so we get some, uh, you know, governments that agree to kind of join back into the union. Uh, they're fairly weak. And this is where we start to see Congress, you know, really starting to um, kind of uh, contradict the ideas of the president and counter propose. So um, Wade and Davis, two members of Congress, are going to um, propose the Wade Davis bill in 1864. It's basically saying, you know, hey, Lincoln, we don't like your plan. We're going to um, create something that's a little bit more, you know, radical. These are radical Republicans. 50% of the 1860 voters need to take an ironclad oath of allegiance, and there's going to be a requirement for a state constitution. So there won't be any state elections until the constitution in every single Southern state gets rewritten. And they have to have certain things in that constitution to um, safeguard freedmen's liberty. So in other words, the constitution gets recreated with some rights for free people who are then going to participate in the government. Uh, the Wade Davis bill gets vetoed. Um, Lincoln just ignores it, ends up being a pocket veto. So it never passes, but it expresses kind of the members of Congress, uh, their ideas, especially the ideas of the, um, uh, you know, radicals. Uh, the 13th Amendment does get passed by Congress in 1865. This is a very big deal because it enables an end to slavery, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime. Uh, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Um, so in other words, this forbids any Southern state from having uh, slavery before um, people were emancipated. So the Emancipation Proclamation freed individual people, uh, but it didn't prohibit any state from recreating slavery. So any state at all could just kind of recreate a uh, law mandating uh, slavery, and then new people could be, you know, enslaved. And so the 13th Amendment would prohibit against that. And it comes about in Congress, it passes in 1865, largely under the radicals, uh, people like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, uh, and it doesn't get ratified until after the death of Lincoln and the end of 1865. But this becomes a component of radical reconstruction. So you know, and, and, and a component of reconstruction in general, even presidential reconstruction, it becomes clear that slavery will end in the South. So very different than say the beginning of the Civil War, where we don't really see that as a case. Um, the other thing about the 13th Amendment is that there's a um, part at the bottom that says, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. It basically says, in order to ensure that slavery does not happen, 
Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So Congress is giving itself some power to ensure that slavery doesn't show up again. The other thing that the radical Congress does, um, radicals in Congress who are getting uh, more moderate members of Congress on board is they create a Freedmen's Bureau. And this is uh, known as the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. And it's designed as kind of a federal organization that's going to um, establish some offices in the South, offer supplies, help to manage abandoned lands. So as Southerners uh, abandon their lands, um, maybe confiscate some of that land, uh, make that union land, and then aid free people. Uh, there are now camps filled with uh, free people who have made it to the Union military or Union lines, and those people are essentially uh, refugees. And the Freedmen's Bureau is organized for funding for one year. So every single year, the Freedmen's Bureau comes up for refunding. So it's like a consistent debate during the entire time of Reconstruction. Uh, Lincoln does do a second inaugural address, and um, we looked at this in class. So I will send you a copy of the address. It's very short. Um, in this address, there's a couple of big takeaways, uh, and I'll show you a, a quote from uh, one of it. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us drive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. From this speech, we can totally get a sense of uh, Lincoln's reconstruction goal, you know, with malice toward none. He is speaking, you know, to the South. We do not have any, you know, hatred for you. Please come back. We will care for the widows and the orphans. And, you know, he's speaking to Southern states in this. So it's a very um, kind of a pointed speech to try to ensure to the South that you know, Reconstruction is kind of the way to go, that you know, establishing the union. There are other parts of the speech, so when you look at the other parts of the speech, he does comment on the significance of slavery as a cause of the war, and he also comments on kind of the, the sin of slavery, if you will, so do take a look at that speech. Um, Lincoln, of course, uh, delivers that speech in March of 1865 um, and is assassinated at Ford's Theater. Um, in um, April of 1865. We watched a brief video about this in class and I will send that to you as a link. Um, we also looked at some documents and this is where you're going to uh, be wanting to catch up. There's a few documents that we looked at in class um, and there's four of them and they all reflect um, the end of the war, either like 1865 or even, you know, like before the war ends or 1865, just as the war is over they reflect um, issues related to the rights of free people and what free people um, define as what they anticipate as freedom. So, you know, one way of looking at reconstruction and evaluating it is getting a sense of how much does it actually bring rights for free people. And we could ask, you know, what did free people, you know, think that they needed and wanted. And so some of these sources speak to that. Uh, the first source is, uh, and I think I might have given you an audio clip on these sources, but the four sources are all based on either conversations, speeches, descriptions of uh, free people who are writing or speaking, you know, what freedom will mean to them and the way in which they see freedom. So, you know, look at what does that mean? And the one uh, source to spend maybe the most time on is the letter from Jordan Anderson, who's a free slave in Ohio, but was emancipated and was earlier a slave in Tennessee. And his old slave master writes him a letter asking him to come back and, uh, you know, maybe for pay, it's not really clear. And he writes a very, um, you know, kind of snarky letter in return. And uh, you wanna get a sense uh, to Jordan Anderson, you know, what is it that freedom means based on the way he wrote that letter. Uh, one other thing I noted in class is um, something that lots of historians uh, who have been doing research on the end of Civil War have noted that lots of free people actually immediately start to put ads in the paper to find um, members of their family. So this is one of those ads. Information wanted of my son, Alan Jones. He left me before the war in Mississippi. He wrote me a letter in 1853 in which letter he said he was sold to the highest bidder. A gentleman in Charleston, South Carolina, Nancy Jones, 
his mother uh, would like to know the whereabouts of this person. Um, and the information can be sent to uh, the pastor of the American Methodist, uh, American, uh, the AME church. So it's, it's an interesting um, letter because, you know, this is like 1853. This is now being written and advertised in 1865, about 12 years, you know, after this individual was sold into slavery. Um, but it gives us a sense of, you know, what freedom is going to mean to a group of people that didn't have it. You know, people are going to go find uh, their family members, right? So this like atrocious part of enslavement where people are separated from their family, you know, it ends up being a, a key part, okay? I'm going to skip that just so we can go to um, some of the other things. Uh, this is where some of the homework um, over the week uh you know, developed. Uh, we went over some of this in class. President Andrew Johnson is the individual who replaced Lincoln. He uh, is kind of a funky, um, you know, replacement. Uh, he was a political pick for Lincoln in 1864 as vice president. He is probably leans a little bit more to the Democrat side. Uh, he was a lot more of a white supremacist, perhaps, than uh, Lincoln was. Not to say Lincoln was an abolitionist. He wasn't. But, um, you know, we have a little bit more of like a Southern um, understanding when it comes to Andrew Johnson. But he also grew up poor and was kind of resentful of the planter class. And so he wasn't like a huge fan of slave um, power either. And uh, he also was a unionist. So he's like the Southerner who's a unionist who kind of stayed in Congress, uh, even though uh, the South seceded. He comes up with a plan that's really not too different than Lincoln's on a lot of levels, and also something that is very um, uh, loose, okay? So basically, um, he, there, there's not even a percentage of people who have, have to you know, be loyal, uh, but people can be, um, Southern states and people can be given amnesty, you know, for serving with the Confederacy upon a simple oath. So basically there's like an oath that's printed, you know, on um, uh, Schoology, you can see the oath. Uh, there's an oath that people have to say, and then even if they were a military officer or whatever, they can be um, given amnesty and kind of come back and serve, you know, in their state government. Um, if they were people with property over $20,000, then they couldn't just take the simple oath. They actually had to be pardoned by Andrew Johnson personally in Washington, D.C. So he made like all of these people come and grovel, uh, and they do. So we end up with lots and lots and lots of people who are previously involved in the Confederacy now in um, this place of amnesty. In new constitutions, the South and Southern states would have to repudiate slavery, so they have to accept the 13th Amendment. Johnson you know, formalizes that. That was the reason for the war. And um, his plan includes the 13th Amendment. It also includes that they would have to, you know, not be seceded. And they also um, won't have the federal government pay any Southern debts. Okay. So these things would be, you know, kind of repudiated. They also would name uh, a provisional governor. Um, and, you know, this uh, Johnson would be naming these provisional governments governors, and they would oversee elections for constitutional convention. So there would be a new state constitution, uh, but this would come down uh, through uh, Johnson. And most of the people who would be involved um, would be, you know, people who were leading Confederates. So like kind of the leading planter classes that were at one time slaveholders and then become, you know, Confederates now would become, you know, leaders of the South. And so there's a great deal of alarm about this. And the reality is that Johnson will grant lots of Southerners pardons and you end up with um, a uh, constitutional process where state constitutions will fall short of some of what they're supposed to do. They might have embraced the 13th Amendment, but they also create black codes um, that largely bring back some degree of slavery. So there is a huge amount of um, uh, kind of looseness that's happening in the South. Under Andrew Johnson, you know, Southern states are getting to uh, do a lot of um, the constitutional uh, process, you know, without really making that many changes. And to radicals, this is not going to be enough. And the Black Codes uh, become very uh, important. You looked at one from the state of Mississippi uh, that really um, is pretty strict. You know, not only can um, people who um, are Black not um, and previously enslaved, they cannot have um, any access to weapons. They cannot um, have any, um, you know, means to assemble uh, in groups. Uh, there's a lot of prohibitions about behavior. So, 
you know, a long list of behaviors that can get them arrested. Uh, they also have to have a job and they have to have a home. So in this like transition place from becoming largely like a refugee to becoming something else uh, can earn somebody an arrest. And so the Mississippi Black Codes uh, give a lot of opportunities for Southern political leaders to arrest um, and law enforcement to arrest formerly enslaved persons. And then they get charged with a fine. If they can't pay the fine, they have uh, they have they get sent out uh, to to be hired by somebody until they pay off the debt. So uh, to many radicals, that felt a lot like slavery. Okay, um, lots of um, people who were freed um, didn't have an opportunity to save resources or get capital for land. So ultimately, they become tenant farmers. You know, making small amounts of money or keeping a small amount of the productivity, you know, on somebody else's land. So like very restrictive situation uh, in the South. And this is where we're going to see the creation of uh, radical reconstruction. And it's here that I'll stop uh, because what we'll do in class um, this week is address radical reconstruction. And um, that'll be uh, the key uh, thing. Okay. Um, and this is where we see Congress, you know, breaking with the president. Um, and there's going to be a lot of back and forth between Andrew Johnson and the Congress. The Congress is not going to allow Southern delegates in. Um, so like people show up in their, you know, Confederate uh, uniforms and radicals are going to say no. Um, and the Congress creates their own committee for reconstruction. And um, Johnson will keep vetoing things that the Congress does. So the next Freedmen's Bureau bill, uh, a new Civil Rights Act, so the first Civil Rights Act in 1866, Johnson will keep vetoing them, but Congress will override the veto. So that becomes significant. Congress's power starts to lean toward the radicals. Some of the moderates in Congress get so ticked off with Johnson that they're going to lean more toward the radicals. Okay, uh, be well.